and we're live. It is Friday, February 12th, 2021, 5.03 p.m. It is Kate Day. I have <laughs> a, inaug oh. this is the inauguration, the official inauguration, uh, a, a Biden inauguration, Cure Royale. Um, and I John drink it. a bottle of champagne. Isn't that sweet? I came home yesterday and he had it. He was like, we can drink it tonight because you closed. Or I'm like, I can't drink anything. I <laughs> so, but there is, uh, this is, um, yes, it's a very nice bottle of champagne. And if, so I'm, I just want to say we are not allowed to have fun anymore, but there are many levels of not having fun and not having fun with a 8,000 word New Yorker article hanging over your head is a different kind of not having fun than not having fun, having cleared that from one's desk. Uh, and so while I wouldn't describe release of the New Yorker article day as fun, I would describe it as an exceptionally good kind of not having fun. Is that fair? Yeah, I don't really feel the fun yet. I'm going to be totally honest. Except I'm allowed, for the you release. can't have fun. You're not allowed to yes, have fun. Ex yes, exactly. <laughs> that is exactly right. Um, the, just, I just dropped a link to the piece in the chat. Um, but All right. I put on mascara for the show today, but apparently I kind of screwed it up. So I don't anyway. know that, <laughs> I, I don't know that I've ever seen you wear makeup. Um, no, I put a little bit of blush on and some mascara, but that's it. But just cause like, I'm so tired that it was like, a, it was like kind of like, it was a little deck chairs on the Titanic moment, but it was, it was a valiant effort. <laughs> All right. Let's dive into this. So this is Ben interviews Kate Day. And for those of you who don't know, like when I interview somebody, uh, uh, you know, the fangs are out, the claws are bared. Uh, Kate, how'd you get into this project? See, uh, that's the kind of tough question. <laughs> no, I actually kind of love that. So there is, um, uh, so, uh, Okay. Like, I think we've made, I've made allusions to this in the show before, but when I was doing my PhD in 2015, I decided I was actually an IT scholar and I decided that I was going to cover the notice. I wanted to know what happened inside the, the companies on um, notice and takedown and whether there was like an adjudication process. Um, and I got really curious about that. And I started like poking around. Turns out there's no fucking adjudication process. They just take things down <laughs> if they're reported and that's it. It's not very interesting. But a bunch of people were like, oh, but there's this other really interesting thing that happens. And it's like with like other types of speech. And I found Jeff Rosen's 2012 um, articles about this, about Google. And he had written about it in Google and the New York Times Mag or about in Wired and the New York Times Magazine. Excellent pieces. And then just like for some reason, this just had not been taken up into like popular knowledge or like this just hadn't like this. It, I almost feel like people just were like, not fully aware enough and the tech had not normalized enough to deal with like this kind of heady issue outside of just like what this technology was and what it meant for society like in the data in people's day-to-day -day lives and so jeff was kind of about ahead of the curve and so i called jeff and it's like hey i'm this young scholar what i want to do this is that okay jeff was beautiful and lovely and said of course i totally support you and so I started this project and people were at when I was at Yale and people were like, this is just not legal. This is just not an actual, this isn't a legal system. And it's like, no, I really think it is like a private, like it's like its own legal system that they developed. And like, um, famously, like I've, as I said before, they failed the paper and I had to rewrite it to satisfy their demands and make it more legal. And then like I threw out that draft and wrote the paper that I wanted to write. And then like it was in the Harvard Law Review and it went like, got a big reception and that was fine but then that kind of like no one had just kind of done the empirical work to prove some of the basic claims that were happening about the company and I went out and did that and so then it was like that paper served as a foundation for a lot of other papers and other people's research and so that was great and that was nothing inside Facebook in fact it was the opposite Facebook refused to talk to me because they were refusing to talk to everyone at the time and I went and interviewed people that were willing to talk around their NDAs or like um, like dozens and dozens of people and um, 
anyway, so that kind of was how I started doing this. But at the end of that paper, I ended with like, wow, it really seems like there are two things that are screwed up here. People who have connections to these companies can get their speech reinstated easily or their accounts reinstated fairly easily when there's been some type of enforcement error or mistake. And the other thing was that like, uh, that there was just like no appeals process for everyday people. Like there was no way for right. people to do this. And so that was kind of like why I started getting really like Lauren, it. for example. No, exactly. It's like I mean, even we even about, yeah. even today, uh, Lauren and my stuff gets taken down the same day, the same minute for exactly the same reason. I can get yep. redress. Lauren cannot. And that slowly like evolved over time, like all of the different things it's changed in like technical details that no one wants to know about except me and like all of these things. But I get super, super in the weeds about it. Then I'm able to make like reasonable and accurate statements that the companies can't dispute about how they do these things. And that's valuable to like, the, I think to the public discourse about this. But anyways, I've been pushing for an appeal system in the end of the piece and due process. And then it wasn't just me, like tons of people have said this before. It wasn't like, it was like, it had been talked about for forever. Um, and then kind of uh, in 2018, and I didn't know this is the time that Noah Feldman had been involved, um, but in 2018, like that piece, oh, sorry, my Harvard piece came out in like spring of 2018 and in the fall of 2018, Zuckerberg announced that this, the idea of like uh, the oversight board. And in an interview with Ezra Klein in April of 2018, he had said like, I can imagine something a little bit like a Supreme Court. Um, and so that was kind of what it got dubbed was like Facebook Supreme Court. But then internally at the company, they really didn't want it to be seen as that, or at least that's what they always said to me. So the, like, in fact, yeah, they just like, they were like, oh, don't say that. Like, that's not, and anyway. Um, so fast forward like six months after or five months after that, I had started like, I don't know, like the Harvard piece helped me gain some legitimacy as this young scholar. It just like kind of like solidified my bona fides and that I was willing, like that I was neutral, that I was descriptive, that I wasn't like me, you know, and in the field and then just generally in law. And then like, honestly, if I went to Facebook and was like, Hey, I want to do this piece. Um, if you give me access, I can try to like pitch, like I will write about it for a law review and like, I will try to write about it for something else. Um, and do you want to like have a conversation? Like, will you let me basically shadow this process of building out this board that you've laid out over the le next year and write about it? Um, and I will get my own funding and I will do all this other stuff. And the person who's had a PR at the time, um, this is this wonderful woman. And she ended up, she just was like, I kind of actually really believed in the project and was like, okay, we'll let you do this. Um, and pushed me to have become inside and have no NDA. I had no, the conditions were no NDA. N I could record every conversation, which, oh my God, I have like gone back to those so much in the last week and <laughs> to be like, no, you said this and I have you taped saying this like in this thing like as people as you fact check the whole piece um and uh and that was for me that was for me to cover me in case they came after me and tried to deny stuff and um yeah and so anyways and uh that was the conditions and then I like started um being like embedded there and writing about it in like the I think I went June 1st of twenty. 2019 was like my first day. So, uh, when you started working on this, um, the oversight board was, as I recall, when it was first announced, I mean, Noah Feldman took it very seriously because it was his idea. Uh, but I think a lot of people regarded it as something of a joke. Uh, or an eccentricity. Um, and certainly that's reflected in your experience at Yale, right? Where the effort to write about the development of rules systems in what became, you know, a Harvard Law Review article, you know, and has, for those viewers who don't know, The New Governors is a, it's an important piece 
and everybody today acknowledges that, including, I suspect, some people at Yale who once upon a time failed it. Um, but um, what, you know, today people criticize the oversight board and people regard, some people regard it as a PR exercise, but nobody's laughing about it anymore. And it's been, you know, kicked the question of whether Donald Trump gets his account back. And so I'm curious, given how little it's done, which is to say it has issued exactly five opinions. Yeah, no, I think it issued some more today. Oh, really? That I didn't know that. Um, so it's issued a handful of opinions. Why has there been a change of thinking in how seriously to take it um, uh, without yet having a genuine track record of A, doing serious work, and B, uh, having that work actually implemented by Facebook? Um. Yeah, I think that, oh, that's, I mean, there's so many parts of it that are great questions, but the, one of the things is like, listen, there's always going to be like, it's super annoying that like, yeah, I started doing the oversight board and like people rolled their eyes and told me it was PR. I mean, it was, it was almost like exactly what had happened in Yale. That's like a perfect comparison. It was just like, people just didn't take it seriously. And this is like, by the way, if you are like a person who constantly has anxiety or like doubts themselves or doesn't have like a ton of like especially if you're, which is, a, I think, especially true when you're in grad school, um, uh, it's like what grad school is known, known for doing is like kind of ripping out all of your self-confidence, you know, like um, you have, you, at some point by the time the oversight board is happening, I was just like, no, this is going to be a thing. Like, this is like, it, like, no one else is seeing it, but I can see it. And I know exactly what's going to kind of the more or less the lines that this is going to take. And no one sees it now. And no one wants to pay attention to it but I'm going to put all of this time and effort and literally like thousands of hours into my, of my life into traveling to Menlo park and following these people around the really kind of man in like, I like Facebook is like a weird place, like to be inside Facebook, like it for really a long is. time. I've I, never like, been for a long time, but oh. that's a, it's a weird place to spend a short amount of time. That roof garden with the foxes is weird. It is so weird. There's so much weird about it. The propaganda is weird. Like it's propaganda on the walls. It's like, it's weird. I don't know. It's like, it was not enjoyable. Like I did not like, like it was, you know, I, I liked individual. I actually liked a lot of the people on the team. They worked really hard, but like, I did not enjoy overall, like being away from John, being away from Nina. I pull, I did so many red eyes back and forth. I did red eyes back to, to Queens would get in at 6 a.m. and then like take a cab straight to work, take a two hour nap on my couch in my office and then go and teach property law. Like that was that was like the pace that I was going at and it was horrible. Um, and so like, but but anyways, to like get to like the, the point of this is like, like this is, a, I just want to say this really quickly. A little part of me is a little bit annoyed that people didn't think this was a big deal and that like you put all this effort into like work like no one else asked for access into this uh into this project um not a single person i was the only person that was like asked facebook if i could cover this and then did all of this work and one of the things about all of this empirical work is it is really 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 hard and exhausting and if you're especially if you're going to do a good job with it like I don't just didn't just talk to people at Facebook, of course, like I went and talked to all of the people that were also talking to Facebook. And then I went and talked to the people that were like, like reading about the talks with Facebook. And I talked to like, I got every like, and that was just so much like, ugh. So, anyway, so let's, get let's, back let's, to it, let's but. talk about the embedded thing. Cause, uh, both you and Evelyn Dweck, uh, who writes about the oversight board for me, uh, have taken a lot of shit in the last several weeks about uh, getting access from Facebook. And your you, the point that you made, which Evelyn just made, which I, I think is also relevant to Evelyn, is that the reason 
you got accesses that you asked and you asked at a time that nobody else was that interested. Yes. Um, and they all had the opportunity. They knew it was going on and they were all were like, no, 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 no. It's just a PR bullshit. I'm not going to pay any attention. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm interested in that. Like today, what has the reaction to the article been from the community that has been critical of access, right? Are they reacting to you in somewhat the same way they reacted to Evelyn a couple of weeks ago? Yeah, there's been like a fair amount of that. There's been a fair amount of people that are saying that like kind of coming after me. There was Matt Stoller, um, who I don't like, you know, I just generally don't engage with. He's like, very i don't know he's just a weird dude um but there but he like really he really specifically came after me saying that i had made my career on access to facebook and it was like dude i like did not make my career on access to facebook i made my career on not having access to facebook and then i cared about this other thing and i wrote a new yorker piece and like that's just not what's happening and i know i should ignore him but it's and I, there aren't that many people. I think that most of it has been really positive. But the thing that, the thing that I think is super interesting, are is the criticism, and I also saw this with Evelyn, which is that like Evelyn's dogged, like breakouts, which are so smart in her analysis of these decisions and of all of the board's founding documents and everything else, which has been so excellent. That there's this thing like, oh, if you like Evelyn, hate. Like you're in this, you're legitim, you, you, you silly, silly girls, like you're legitimizing this process. You've been sucked in by Facebook's PR. Like you are like in acting like this is serious, you're making it serious and you're part of the problem. And I'm like, what the, f like, on, like, how are you supposed to respond to that? Like, I thought that Donald Trump was like illegitimately elected without the popular vote from Hillary Clinton. I had like legitimate democratic problems with Donald Trump's election. I like, am I not supposed to like, would you, would somebody that also feels that way not be allowed to like report on him as a president because like you're legitimizing his, no, it's just like a fucking fact that he had became president and it happened and everything moved forward and you have to report it. It's just like, some of these things are just like completely like insane and reporting on them doesn't mean that you agree that they should have happened. But, it's just to I mean, say, like at, at the end of the day, the work speaks for itself, right? There's a text today at seven, 8,000 words in the New Yorker that reflects, that does not reflect a whole lot of insider access bias. Um, in fact, it, it, it's quite neutral as to the question of whether this is an institution that's going to have legs or should have legs or whether, you know, you love the Facebook oversight board or hate the Facebook oversight. I mean, like it actually doesn't say that it does not drip with contempt for the project. Uh, it shows what happened and how it developed. It also, in my opinion, makes them look comically grandiose. And in some um, places, I and, think it does. And they and, were, I mean, and they yeah. like they freaking wrote a charter with quill pens. I mean, they you didn't know. do that. Okay, they the the language of that paragraph like makes them like they wrote it, but they did. That was like at the end of the process, and I think it was it was a joke. And I try I push so hard to put some more details into that paragraph, and we were just running out of words. But like, but yes, but, but that there, was there's like, a there's yes. a grandiosity there to was, it, so and was. they do. Uh, you know, the idea that there some of them were, were crying when the thing got announced. I mean, like, you know, you do, like, whatever this is, it isn't Philadelphia in 1787, right? Which is the way they seem to, to talk about it. So I, I think it's a, um, I think it's a, like, at the end of the day, the concern about access journalism which look as a Washington insider type, I don't have a lot of patience for that concern. Though there are people for whom it uh, it is an issue, but um, the concern about it is you end up with a kind of regulatory capture source based bias, and I just don't see how anybody looks at that this piece and finds that. So no. what's the 
Like, what's the criticism of the piece that you shouldn't be covering it at all? Yes, that is the criticism of the piece. And that I just think is not a very like that's not a very um, I think it's a very I don't think that's a very legitimate criticism. Listen, two things. One is like to that point, like, what do I not cover it at all? And now it's hearing whether or not Trump, a world leader, it's, should be it's gonna permanently decide banned whether, from the platform. It's going to yes. decide whether Donald Trump gets to be on Facebook. And would you rather that, like, someone was inside and wrote, like, a balanced take and has, like, tons of knowledge that's on the cutting room floor about what that process was like to build that okay. institution and knew that or not? And let's I not, feel like... Let's, yeah. let's not waste any more time on this silly issue. Um, if anybody wants to uh, present this in civilized, this criticism in civilized English, flag me in the in the uh, Q and A or the the. Um, but I I think this issue is dumb. So talk me out of it if you want. But and I'll let you come on and make the make the case. But failing that, uh, let's ignore it. All right. Before we go to audience questions, and I want to save a lot of time for audience questions. Um, uh, I want to ask you one more big question, which is um, the, what do you think the realistic range of possibility is for what the, uh, what the institution turns into? You know, do, is it, it could end up being the Supreme Court of Facebook or it could be end up flaming out and being a PR exercise? Or is there some narrower range in your mind of realistic possibilities? Hold on, sorry, I was looking at the Q&A. Can you say that really quickly one more time? Yeah, what is the realistic range in your mind of the possible um, uh, institutional oh, the... outcomes for the- like, Oh yeah. It, Go ahead. Yeah, so like, so there's like something that Jamal, it's not in the piece, but Jamal Green, who is one of the co-chairs and um, he's been on the show to talk about this. Um, he is a Columbia Law School professor um, and um, brilliant in my opinion. He's, uh, but he said something really interesting, which was like, well, when you make a body of 20 people that are, is very illustrious and all experts in free speech and you give them decisions to make on free speech, like, like, just like whether or not Facebook listens to them, their decisions are going to become part of the customs and norms of international law. They're going to become influential, just as like, if they like write these decisions, they're going to slowly become influential. And like, this is 100% like, um, not 100%, I don't think that's what he said, but the, this is just going to be like, this is going to become a thing, whether we like it or not. I just... There's a bunch of different things that the board could be. I actually go into this in the, God, there's no way anyone wanted to hear about this for the New Yorker, but in the Yale Law Journal piece, I go into like all the different ways that this could end up like blowing up. And like, I go through four different options of like, you know, Twitter buys into the Facebook oversight board and they let the, this board make decisions or they create their own board and like buy into the trust. And there's like all of these different things. But all of these, I think what's really uncomfortable for people is that there is this, and we've talked about this so many times before, but I really want to just put stomp it. There's all of this disintegration of the power of like nation states. And there is this massive power held by private companies, but private companies are exercising governance over individual, like over their users' human rights. And so people are pushing and angry that they're not listening to them, that there's no type of dem demo, like that they say that they're into like these kind of democratic principles, but they're not living it. And so this is like, I think the oversight board and democratization isn't quite the right word, but participatory or something um, accountable or transparent is part of it, is like a step toward that. And I think it's just a really profound shift in like the way the world has worked for the past like, couple hundred years um to be totally honest and i just think that like people are railing against it and they go to things they know and what they know is government represents them so government should regulate these companies and then they forget that they explicitly like 
bound the hands of government to regulate speech because governments can be really powerful bad actors to censor individuals and right. so like it's like it's just like this like crazy and this is just this crazy sorting out mechanism that we're in at the moment and like i just feel like people are just not being like the frustration i have is that people aren't thinking through the things that they're saying and the implications that they're saying like when they say things like why can't they just take down fake news there's no like conversation about like how that would be happening or like what that would mean and that is like i guess what i'm like i I, what i think is problematic all right our first question uh has just been texted to me by somebody i am not going to identify um uh but who asks i'm curious who kate thinks should be added to the board uh, 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 for uh, of new members, what sort of person is missing and why? And does the board need some people who are actually trained with security backgrounds uh, as opposed to, you know, international human rights lawyers or journalists or people who focus on free speech issues only? What sort of person's missing? Yeah, it's a great question. So the first 20 members of the board do have like a very profound international human rights perspective. There were, were, I say were because Pam Carlin has left the board, um, but there were five members of the board um, who were American. And um, I think that there needs to be much greater representation from India, um, like specifically just because it's such a huge market share of, of the U.S. and or of the U.S., of Facebook and that India is also just like the, like this giant democracy also that is having very similar problems to what we're having in, in the United States. Um, and so that really needs to happen. I think that the global South is a huge thing, but in terms of like professional expertise, I honestly think that the board is lacking in people that need have technical knowledge and uh, about the engineering side of these decisions. And like what they're like, what the implications are, um, and how they can be implemented at Facebook. Um, and then like, yeah, I would say like security is like a huge one. I would say, but I don't know what like secure from what. Like I don't I don't know what like exactly a security thing would mean at this point. Like someone with a background in cybersecurity, someone with a background in like encryption, but that goes well. To the well boy, the the board's first, you know. Uh, hydroxychloroquine opinion made me wish they had somebody with a medical background. Um, right. Or, but that know, wasn't, a, no. A hard but science background. But the, but the hydro, like the, but the COVID opinion was really interesting because like that was, it had nothing to do with a medical background. It was the idea that a person was obviously expressing an opinion about what a policy should be. And so that was honestly a, like a question of like a classic, like first amendment question that our types of courts deal with is like opinion versus opinion versus like a like a fact right and like is this is this you know and is this just a person's opinion on a policy um or not and uh there i would actually think that the more pressing thing would have been someone that was just more familiar with what the long-term harms of disseminating an opinion like that would be than medical information. Does that make sense? Like it wasn't like the accuracy of the medical information that was a question. Right, no, 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 but I I just mean like you have, there's a set of issues that where you're talking about real world harms, human safety, in this case, uh, you know, distribution of uh, uh, bad, bad medical information uh, that, you know, can get people killed and, they have a lot of people who say, you know, in a traditional First Amendment way, but it's not imminent, but, you know, and they don't have a lot of people who say, you know, um, uh, this is a really dangerous organization that's going to get people killed. Or in this case, this is a really dangerous uh, uh, fad in right wing circles that you know you, you take hydroxychloroquine and st- uh, instead of standard therapies and you're going to you know get better from covid and you know just the spread of that belief is something that's going to cause a lot of people to die and i do think they're missing they're missing a lot of uh, they're heavy on the on the sort of either whether you frame it as a first amendment 
view or as a um or as an international human rights view they're 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 heavy on that side and there seem to be light on the real world consequences side yeah let me so i actually have a really specific formulation about why that happened so these cases like the first couple of cases they have they're all obviously things that were taken like well it was six cases and four of them were from users and two of them had been referred by facebook and in the four user cases there is they overturn facebook um which means that they side with the user and here is this really interesting thing about how this actually looks when the board gets it it is like the user's statement, like this one person. And then it is like this Goliath, like it's like Facebook saying why they enforce what they enforce. They then go and get international human rights and other things to weigh in. This was the Azerbaijan case. They had like UNESCO right a report and all of these things. It was very thoughtful. But what it comes down to is like very clearly a dispute rec- resolution mechanism. And there is strong sympathy it's not, I don't even know that it's so much that there's, it's so pro free speech. Like it is that, that it's pro that in particular user in that instance. And that's like, they genuinely think that that user was misunderstood. And so the speech should go back up. Right. right. And so like, but of course, if like, you're up, but, but that, that's fine. Again, this yeah. gets to the issue that you write about in the piece, which is, are they resolving the, the narrow question of the specific matter before them or are they creating precedent for how Facebook should handle situations like that in the future uh, as well as retroactively and obviously if they're not thinking about precedent at all it isn't worth 130 million dollars to create the institution at all unless you're doing you know unless the Carol Cadwalladers are right and they're doing it purely for uh, yeah. PR benefit, it's only worth doing if you're trying to create some precedential value, in which case you don't want to think too narrowly about the case at hand. Yeah. So in the COVID case, they put the, put it back up. But the policy recommendation was specifically to take harms more into account in the future with their policy. So it was like, listen, the policy that you have right now, this is fine. Like, you have to keep this up. And you can't retroactively enforce a policy that doesn't exist on this individual, but you should change your policy. And then Facebook did like Here, like two days ago. Here's so. my recommendation to the oversight board. And then we're going to go to Genevieve, who's been waiting very patiently. Number one, they should I'm have scientific. I need more champagne. They should have scientific expertise. Uh, they should have medical expertise. They should have counterterrorism expertise. Oh, and counterterrorism. Ooh, yeah, that's a, a really great the, point. That's a, good, a lot I think of this that's stuff right. is going to end up being. Are there going to be CT issues? You know, if you're trying to decide how to handle, uh, uh, you know, a Charlie Hebdo like situation. Uh, I don't mean the the shootings. I mean the, you know, publication, publication issue. Yeah. Right, right issue. You actually want some CT people in the room. By the way, you also want some Muslims in the room. I was. Um, there are Muslims and, in the room. Yeah. This. So that, like, like, but I think Cal like Cal having, is, yeah, it was, and Carol Call got dragged, like her inclusion has been very controversial. She's like second most controversial after Pam, but whatever. But I think it's like, like having some people who are really focused on the categories of harm. Yeah. Um, yeah. It would be super useful. I agree. Genevieve Delaferra, you get the first question today. Hello. Thank you for writing it, number one. That was really fun to read. And then my question was, there seems to be like a real preoccupation with institution building around the court, especially at Facebook. Is the focus on building the court's esteem getting in the way of it actually like establishing itself as a legitimate body of governance? And just to tag on to like a later question, do you think they might have missed their Marbury versus Madison case? Or is that like coming possibly? No, interesting. Um, So I think that they have this, um, no, the institution building is, so there was this really interesting thing that was like constantly happening with the drafts, which was like, okay, like we, there was this like directive of like the board being independent, like people were obsessed with this being independent. And I go into this in the Yale article. It's like, I I kind of identified all the different ways it had to be independent, but one of the ways it had to be independent was that all of its 
day-to-day operations and like running and the administration of the institution and establishment of the institution couldn't be overly defined by Facebook because it wasn't Facebook's job to define the institution. The institution had to, to some extent, define itself. And a practical standpoint, you bring in a bunch of people who are maybe not like me and Evelyn Duick and haven't been following the oversight board all the time or even that familiar with content moderation and you try to like read them into the room on this and then tell them how to build an institution, they're gonna be like, what the fuck do we do? And like, how is this gonna work and what's important? The people they ended up choosing, especially as co-chairs were specifically chosen because of their possible, like because of their past history and being strong in leading institutions and institution building. And so like, basically, like, I think that the board leans more heavily on that um, as a as a as a as an identifying characteristic right now than it did before. So like, or than it will in the future rather. So like, what I mean is like right now, I think that there's a really heavy emphasis on people with free speech backgrounds, international human rights, and institution building experience. And I think it needs to move. And this goes to the last question: it needs to move into like tech, CT, like all of these other types of things um, as it goes forward. But it is really critical to build the institution. There's a bunch of things that they've done, the board, that are completely independent and were never defined by the founding document. So one of the things they wrote about was like that they're and that Evelyn agreed with me, there should be like a notice and comment period or like an ability to file amicus briefs in these cases that was never imagined in any of the in any of the, the written founding documents that Facebook created. But the board immediately did that on its own. And like all of those types of like, so those types of um, those types of things um, have been, those are all the institution establishing itself and trying to define itself. And um, there's a lot of small moments like that. Um, that's probably, I think, the biggest one. Um, and they're still figuring it out, which is, I think, part of the reason that people keep are flipping out because they kind of are just like, like they haven't been fully defined yet. And they're just trying to make hold everything together and make sure it works. And they're supposed to be a, like, obviously, they're supposed to be judging and overseeing Facebook, but it was absolutely necessary that they work with Facebook at the beginning to get going. And like, that is always going to be a struggle. That is, like, by the way, one of the reasons I think it was so critical that I was reporting this during that time, because I feel like I was talking to people at that moment that were had been named to the oversight board or were in the administration and people at Facebook. And I was hearing both sides of this. And like, I think that like, it kept it honest. Like I just was like, like nosing around. I don't know. I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying it was because of me, but like, I'm saying that like, but there like, but that was like one contributing factor. Like it was like someone was following and watching really closely. Can I just say, you know, that the fact that this story and it's taken 41 minutes of the hour for us to oh get my to God. this point really actually broke some news Oh yeah, uh, with respect. I mean, broke a lot of news with respect to the oversight board, but it broke some news with respect to Donald Trump, that he was upset about the composition enough about the oversight board to call Mark Zuckerberg and personally complain about it, included specifically to complain about uh, Pam Carlin's inclusion. Uh, it seems to me that is a complete answer to the critics who say this institution isn't worth covering. It's something that the president of the United States cares enough about. It's deciding his fate. <laughs> yes. And even before that, it's something that the president of the United States calls, you know, the third richest person in the world to bitch about. I mean, like, that, that, that's some, that's some, uh, and you know. And he shut down. Yeah. There wasn't that's, anything. That's it's kind of an interesting thing. I brought Genevieve back because um, uh, 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 her second question, which I hadn't noticed, was really interesting, and I, uh, I thought, thought she asked I, it. Uh, oh no, maybe you, not. Or maybe I didn't uh, answer it. Ye, the the move into advisory opinions. If you've if Genevieve has asked, I haven't heard you ask it. Oh, sorry. Go answer ahead, it. So. So if you've asked it, ask it again, and this time, Kate, answer it. Kate kind of touched on it, though, in her response and was, do you think they're going to start getting into, like, advisory opinions and, like, have, like, address issues preemptorily? Oh, um, so Jamal specifically spoke to me, and this is in the piece. He says, like, they, 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 they touched on this when the 
looting and shooting thing happened like three weeks into their existence. And um, he said, like, basically the answer was like, we probably shouldn't be like, maybe we'll like start weighing in on things that are not directly before us, but like definitely not now before we're not even doing what it was we were brought here to do and like we're like three months old so or three weeks old and so i think that that's i think that that kind of sums it up i don't know what they're going to do they do issue um i really think that people don't understand kind of that like legitimacy is not like like a like it's not like giving someone a cookie like or something or like uh, like it's not like it's not like a thing that like it's a it's a it's an it, like an ephemeral concept that is built over time with trust and like and oh my gosh everyone drank norms and so there's uh and so i think that like that is kind of um that will build the power of the board and really define whether or not it's um whether or not it's able to kind of expand its remit on its own but some of it's technically limited um, from Facebook side. And then some of it is like, they can write whenever they want. Like the wolf, you know, it'll see what they come together. And it's also interesting to see how the board members continue to coalesce. Or then if like people are appointed to the board, how they strike out and kind of like talk out on their own as board members and like voice their opinion. Uh, so that'll be interesting. Hi, Katie. All right, Katie, uh, uh, I think this is your first time on screen. Is that right? Yep, that's right. Um, well, welcome to In Lieu of Fun. Your question today has been uh, the upvoting champion, uh, and it's an interesting one. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, so, Kate, my question is, most of the critics I've seen today have been largely men um, and to kind of attacking you personally and your reasons for writing the article. So to what extent do you attribute that to misogyny and how do you cope with that? really nice um uh well i want to point out that a lot of my defenders uh david k mike godwin jeff jarvis dave hoffman there were like a bunch of people who like went right at matt stoller after he like kind of wrote all this stuff um those were all men too so i just kind of want to point that out and like obviously ben but like i don't know i think that some of it i think that both um, I think that both Evelyn and I have the disadvantage of being young and the disadvantage of being women. And so I think that that is something that like just, and like, I especially don't take myself a particular, I don't, I don't like, there's not a huge persona that I put on that's super professional as everyone on the show knows. Like I, what you see is what you get. And like, it is like just authentic Kate all the time. And like, as much as I can be like, I mean, I'm not like, you know, you're not coming into the bathroom with me, but like you get the, you get the point. Um, yeah, I think that some of it is misogyny. You want to know what I really think it is? I think that it is that I think that it is like sour grapes and not having the access themselves or not having identified this as serious early on and kind of getting like missing the boat when like everyone was talking about this and they didn't take it seriously. And I, I just have to be totally honest. That's exactly like to a person, even like to the women and the men, like it all feels like, well, I never thought this was actually going to be something that got off the ground or that anyone really talked about. Uh, so I'm going to take down the person who made a different bet than me. <laughs> and so like, that's what it feels like um, in order to like, and I just, it was, I, I'm not like, I don't want to like, yeah. And the Matt Stuller stuff, that felt like misogyny. Like he just like went after, he just said things that were inaccurate about my career and he continues to. And like, I just don't even know, like, I don't know like what that's about. Like, it's just absolutely untrue. Like, so. Just in the spirit of this, uh, not the misogyny point, but of Kate's uh, uh, point about uh, a certain degree of professional envy as to identifying this issue. And I think it's more about having identified the issue honestly than it is about the access in particular. But I am reminded of the great poem uh, Verses on the Death of Dr. Swift by Jonathan Swift, who he says, we all behold with envious eyes our equal raised above our size. Who would not at a crowded show stand high himself, keep others low? 
I love my friend as well as you, but would not have him stop my view and let him have the higher post? I ask for but an inch at most. Dear Honest that is Ned is- really good. Yeah. Sorry. Dear, <laughs> dear Honest Ned is in the gout, lies racked with pain and you without. How patiently you hear him groan. How glad the case is not your own. And there's a certain amount of that going on. Well, this um, is also too, how glad the case is not your own. But there's also just like, again, it's not as if Matt Stoller would have done what I did. Like, it's not as he is someone right. who like they walked up to him and given. He didn't want to do this don't job. Don't want to do the work. <laughs> like, and <laughs> um, But really kind of uh, it uh, annoys them to see other people uh, uh, getting attention for things that they wouldn't have done but wish they had done. Um, I do want to say on the misogyny point, the people who went after Evelyn were mostly female. Yeah. Um, and kind of um, like sad point about it. Uh, and so, and by the way, there may be like query whether that's a different kind of, you know, thing. Um, but I, I do think uh, there, look, there, it, it's one, if, if, when somebody writes an article, uh, eventually the text of that article has to stand on its own. And, you know, if you have a problem with what Kate wrote, if you have a factual problem, if you think she left out something important, that's the thing to criticize. And, or you know, if you want to ask me about my access or anything, I'm happy. I think that there is a, a conversation to be had around how the, the companies do all of this and the thing. But, like, it's not my problem that this is how, but how no, this and, entire and, thing is working. No, that, that even that's too generous, Kate. I okay, mean, okay, I sorry. Mean, let, sorry, let me, let me go medieval on these people for a minute. Um, <laughs> if, if you have a problem with Facebook's, with the way Facebook is behaving, um, criticize Facebook. Um, if you have a problem with what, you know, what the oversight board it is, criticize the oversight board. By the way, it's going to be hard to criticize the oversight board without citing Kate's article because it gives a whole lot of the information that you would have will come from that. Um, there's a certain amount of this that's just, um, uh, I, you know, I, I think that's people wanting the institution to be untouchable, wanting Facebook to be untouchable. And as Kate said earlier, just kind of wanting like, uh, you know, any anything that anything that that touches it has to has to burn. And, you know, I do think there's probably also an element of misogyny uh, and sort of anti younger female bias in it as well, at least especially in the tone. Um, yeah, Alice totally. Lee, the floor is yours. Hi, Alice. Hi. Um, okay, so my question so I've been asked by the chat to ask a slightly different question, which I think is also a good one. I'd love so, first of all, I absolutely think they should get rid of the newsfeed if that was the one shocking <laughs> line for them. Um, <laughs> second of all, um, I would be really interested in hearing more about the textualism versus, um, kind of, I don't know what the opposite of textualism is, uh, debate. <laughs> And <laughs> I don't. Constitutionalism. <laughs> yeah, um, and I'm interested in how much faith there is in the rules, and if you think that that is as written by Facebook, and if you think that is well grounded, um, and if they were to rewrite the rules, could they get more um, and control over engineering decisions? And yeah. Wait. So, if who is to rewrite the rules? Uh, the oversight Facebook? board itself. I don't know if that's on okay. the. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So to the. You wrote, you did write about the engineering decisions. So like, but let's go with the textualism, living originalism kind of theory. This was like super, super, super interesting because of course, like I, not maybe not of course, I had been watching the development inside Facebook and following this team around. And in all of my, like, we would have these sprawling conversations about this, like of like, well, are they going to just be like looking at the letter of the law? on community standards and like basically looking at it like it's the common law and being like, yes, this is wrong. No, this is right. The exact thing that we just talked about then, like, yes, this is opinion. No, this is not like, clearly this is not, but you should change. But the big move is that they say that you you should change the rule. You should change the policy if you can, if you can. And that's like kind of the big thing. So for like the Goebbels post, it's very 
hard. Let's put this in terms of like for technical for technicality's sake, and I've made this analogy before on the show, they put up a net and they like decide that like they really like the net is like I don't know, like a mile long to catch all of like the like the white supremacists that are like lionizing Goebbels on on Facebook and they miss some stuff and people freak freak out. So they make a giant, giant, giant net. And frankly, they get a lot of crap about keeping Goebbel or about like keeping Goebbels stuff up if it's like PR gets a lot of crap for pe- keeping up like Nazi lionizing quotes and no not a lot of crap about taking down Goebbels quotes that are even shared in criticism or like to point out, like to make an analogy to Donald Trump or something like that. Right. Like things that are said in like kind of the spirit. And so like Facebook's motivations there are just like, listen, like, I don't know what we're going to do. Like, like, yes, we're getting like a hundred dolphins, but we have to get that one shark because there is like this, like when that one shark gets through, there's like, all of this spreading that happens and all this other stuff and people freak out and I get that. And so that actually is what gets to your technical expertise problem, which is that I don't think that right now there is a ton, there are a ton of people who really understand the scalability and technical side and the automated versus human side of this system at Facebook that are on the oversight board and I'm hoping that is going to get a little bit more sophisticated going forward. And I think it's fine right now. Like, I think that it's like a, that was a fine place to take the cost. But um, yeah, I don't know. I don't, as for things like getting rid of news feed, like, no, they're not really that. I don't know that that's ever going to be in their like remit. That's never like, it doesn't really make sense for that to be in their remit. Um, but maybe like I could say, but it's going to be a long time before it is, is basically what I'm saying. Like it's, it's unclear how, how large this will go and whether it will like kind of take over more and more of the core product of the company. But right now it's designed to take over as I kind of go into the piece, like these two sides that like Mark kind of talked about, which were like the top the side that is like the product side and then like how the product influences policy side. I, there's a piece that's missing from that that people were really that people talk to me about a lot, which is that the, that Facebook is also in the midst of trying to understand and be more preemptive about engineers talking to policy before something goes live. That was not previously kind of or always the case. Um, and if anyone's worked inside a software company and built a product, as Alice, I'm sure you know, you code something and you're just so excited about making it work and you're not thinking about the implications on society or everything else. And I think that's a normal thing. Like if you're interested in building things, this is like how a lot of innovation happens. So, oh God, it's 556. Sorry, Ben. Um, anyways, that's like kind of basically what I'm saying. The living versus originalism. I just think that they're going to like, the conversation is basically like, it's going to expand. Like, I think that the conversation is actively happening within the board about like how expansive the decisions should be and how quickly. And that is what I kind of mean. And I think right now with the decisions that came out, it's very clear that they're not going to be, they're going to be super textual as to like the specific takedown. And then they're going to accompany them with some very broad policy and very specific policy uh, decisions. I'm not hearing anything. Oh, I wasn't either. I didn't hear you either. Oh, there oh, you go. That's because I'm muted. <laughs> Oblio, you get the last question today. I, I had a two-part question, but I think you might have answered the first part. But do you think Zuckerberg and Sandberg are genuinely sincere in their pursuit of oversight? And do you think they're willing to accept an oversight decision that would impact their profit? Um, they're not faced with um, taking an oversight board decision right now that would impact their profit because the binding commitment that they've made to the oversight board is only to like the specific piece of content and the specific uh, takedown or put back up. And um, there is, so like, yes, but in the future, uh, and this is a little bit to the point that I was making, yeah, I think that it might. And 
I think that it would depend. Like, I mean, it would really, it would really depend. And like, what I, what I think is most interesting about this is that if they, if the oversight board made that type of recommendation, and again, Evelyn has written about this and she like kind of was like, um, has made this observation. It was the first to kind of make this observation that this is what's called like a kind of form of weak form review, um, which is that like the it, legally speaking, it's this idea that the board puts forward an idea and then the, uh, and then Facebook has to, within a certain amount of time, respond to it. And there's, so that's the second part of, uh, of what Facebook is responsible for or obligated to do that is important. And so like, if they did make a suggestion in the future that compromises the bottom line of Facebook, Facebook has to say, well, it doesn't have to say, but it has to give an explanation for why it doesn't decides not to do it. And I think the transparency on that would be just as important as whether or not they make the decision. And the pushback that comes from their reaction will be just as important as like whether or not they make the decision, if that makes sense. We're going to leave it there. Kate Klonick, you're a great American. Uh, and uh, you've written a very great article. Um, and you should get some sleep tonight uh, and have I some more champagne. I took a nap today and it was awful. It was awful. I just wanted you to know. It was awful. Did I tell you about this nap? Hold on really quickly. Did I tell you about this nap? No. Um, I but you should. A nap. I took a nap and I went to bed at 730 and I took a nap until 11. And the remember the career ending mistake? The entire dream. Okay. Well, first there were two things. The entire dream. All I dreamt about was just like, one, I was like in a house that was not mine. And it was filled with dying puppies. And then simultaneously, I was getting texts from people, every single source that I had ever talked to saying that they had they were going back on like what they had said. And like, in particular, the dream was that Microsoft was like, we never made the Zoom. We never did that. That was the uh, thing that happened. Right. And like, like, that's. And I was like, uh, I was like, I, I did was, warn you about that dream. I did. <laughs> And I woke up and like instead I had a very nice email from David Remnick in my inbox and it was much better than that. <laughs> well, that is excellent. You should look at the poll. Um, oh, what's the poll? Oh, yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Do I seem that tired? I do my eyes. Look no, no, tired. you're, you're, but, uh, I just know you are. Um, yes. <laughs> we're going to leave it there. Uh, we will be back tomorrow. It'll be just us tomorrow. Uh, but we will not uh, uh, be interviewing each other. Um, oh my God, thank and God. And until then, can't wait. we don't have fun anymore. But in lieu of fun, we are allowed to go to sleep.